Let's make the future. Please enter your address code followed by the pound or hash sign. Okay, the feedback tells me that it works. Future, a discussion about future trends, technologies, and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. This episode's regular panelists, Michael Oloranimo and Michael Curry. Our guest is legendary Silicon Valley software engineer, John L. Sokol. In a career spanning over 30 years, John has pioneered several internet and streaming video technologies. He has multiple patents to his name, and he has served as CTO at several Bay Area startups. He has done everything, from releasing the first open source Unix distro in 1991, to building in 2014 a moving telepresence robot. He's currently software engineer at LiDAR startup Luminar. This episode's discussion topic, people carrying drones. Welcome to Let's Make the Future. I'm Michael Curry. My name is Michael Lauren Lugo. I'm based on the Bay Area in California. Why don't we have our uh, guests introduce themselves? John, please go ahead. I'm also based out in Silicon Valley. Uh, currently, I'm working for a company called Luminar Technology that's building an advanced LiDAR for self-driving vehicles. And basically, I consider myself a robotics expert. Fantastic. You know, one side of prediction is ahead of its time is that when I introduce it to people, they laugh. <laughs> so I feel like that means that I'm on to something, although it might also mean that I'm crazy. So self-driving cars, I feel like the concept of a self-driving car, that kind of made people laugh until very recently. But now it's widely accepted that it will come to pass in the next few years. But the concept of drones, specifically self-driving, let's say people carrying drones, still triggers the laugh factor, at least when I introduce it at the dinner parties. Despite that, though, Uber has a uh, flying car program and Airbus recently uh, put out a white paper on the topic. So there's clearly some potential in this technology. And what I'd like to do today is to explore the current state of affairs with the technology and where it might take us by speculating far into the future. So what have you guys seen lately in terms of the current applications for drones? I believe that Amazon is testing drone delivery in uh, the United Kingdom. They just did a delivery a couple of months ago. But have you guys seen anything in the news in the last few months? There's about eight startups right now in Silicon Valley doing flying vehicles. I can't list them off the top of my head, but the Facebook group that you uh, contact We've actually gone through and through a set a number of links, and, and even some of the founders are in that Facebook group right now. So there's a lot of activity in the space for drones that can carry full-size human passengers. There's actually one that had a big crash over in the, what airport is that? There was an airport recently that my friend had like 10 cameras running in like 4K high resolution when they actually accidentally went up like 20 feet and slammed down the ground. There's a company called like Elkhart or something like this. Oh, damn. Which was like a VTOL experimental aircraft. Well, the guy was fine. I guess he got a little bruised, but it's like spectacular footage. You just watch it. You're just like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, they were doing a small taxi down the runway, and it, it accidentally like went up and slammed down again. Oh, uh, that's terrible. It completely destroyed their aircraft. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this this site he pulls up military 20 years ago. Uh, at this point, we've got $5 MEMS gyros that can do the job and control systems. And as soon as you go electric rather than try to do this, all internal combustion power suddenly controlling the engine speed dynamic through software becomes trivial. But it was funny because, you know, we had, I guess we'll call it the Hacker Mansion, this uh, unbelievable estate up in Portola Valley where we had some initial meetings that spawned that Facebook group. There was a lot of people advocating for internal combustion engines and I'm like, no, no, why would you want to do such a thing? I mean, suddenly you end up with all this complicated mechanical systems that are difficult to, to control and I can do everything with brushless DC motors that are like 98% efficient and controlling them to do, let's say, a quadcopter is just an upscale version of your small consumer drones. So quadcopter technology is fairly 
it's taken about as far as it's going to go. I'd say it's actually reasonably mature. Although when you actually talk about flying vehicles, you need to get something that's kind of a hybrid with wings to really get your efficiencies up. John, that's fantastic. And I did get most of that. We're hearing a little bit of a fluctuation in your audio though. So I think for the best chance here, why don't we, it sounds like Michael found the phone number for you to call in on. I think that'll improve the audio. Okay, the feedback tells me that it worked. So John, you were talking about how there was a group of people that are interested in developing people carrying drones in Silicon Valley, and they've made some significant progress. And then you were telling us about an unfortunate crash that occurred recently with one of the startups. Well, I didn't even realize that this startup existed. I, so I'm a senior member of an organization called the Hacker Dojo, which is now in Santa Clara. We were in Mountain View, which is sort of an eclectic bunch of people. So it's a, a hacker space where a lot of us go and hang out and work on various projects. So one of the guys there is a uh, television professional news videographer type that just films aircraft stuff. And so he was actually filming the first flight of this prototype and got on video the most spectacular footage of this thing. And it crashed in the Hollister airport. So he had pictures of this small foot and a half across prototype that they were demonstrating. And then there was the full size aircraft on the runway that he actually videotaped the uh, prototype crash of. So, you know, there is risk involved. <laughs> in perfecting these things. And I was told the only reason why it crashed was the seat that the pilot was on had collapsed under him. The rest of the aircraft was actually in perfectly working order had the seat not actually buckled under the pilot. <laughs> right. So you talk about like a funny failure, you know what I mean? The seat wasn't designed properly. It's always the thing you, you didn't expect. But I wonder if, so you, what you're saying is in this case, there was a pilot sitting in the aircraft. I would be more interested in drones that are self-driving or uh, people carrying vehicles that are self-driving. But I suppose that's another step. That's a very interesting discussion because, again, this initial meeting that we had it must have been about two years years back now, which seemed to like really kind of start this, this arms race in this area. You know, some people were very, you know, we want to do this more like traditional aircraft. And there's, you know, my roommate went off with my other roommate, filed patents and did an entire paper and talk on a runway version that it would have to do this short takeoff and landings with some kind of autonomous vehicle helping push it along. And I was like, no, it's going to be VTOL. You know, you're going to take off straight up and down. And then there's issues of noise level in the neighborhood and things like this. And, you know, I've been an advocate of this kind of integrated self-driving and self-flying, which is now conceptualized in the Airbus and put together some beautiful presentations and stuff like this. I don't know if that somehow came from my thought over to them somehow, but that definitely embodied the concept I was trying to push, which is you've got your cargo container with your personal sort of portable living room and sound system that you habitate, and then the wheels versus wings versus putting it on on a train or whatever, more like the intermodal container system, but for human passengers concept. So there's a lot of different ways of going about this. You know, I was always pushing for this more of a, a Wonka Vader concept. I don't know if you remember Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Or the Willy Wonka and the Great Glass Elevator, right? Yeah. Well, that's basically the glass elevator where you step in and you push a button and it takes you across campus. You know, in the case of, let's say, Stanford or the Google campus, which composes of hundreds of buildings scattered over tens of miles. And, you know, you're not actually flying the vehicle. The vehicle itself is self-navigating and doesn't really need to go up more than a few hundred feet above the power lines and stuff, but well below normal air traffic space. So John, are you, just to clarify, are you in this elevator concept talking about a box that is tethered to the actual powered lift vehicle or is it integrated and the actual, the propeller blades actually land down on the ground in the vehicle? I'm just picturing an, el an actual elevator box right now, but... I was actually you know, sketched out some rough concepts where we have a, a circular impeller on the top using the Bernoulli effect. Oh, there's a term for this, but I, it's too early in the morning for me to think of. I, I guess I go look on my, my notes and find <laughs> out. But instead of having propeller blades in the normal sense, it would literally be a circular acrylic tube that you step into that looks like a phone booth from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure that would just lift you up and take you across campus and land. And then there'd be a the building 
building to receive this and, and then provide recharging of the vehicle or whatever its power source is. Fascinating. But again, there's a lot of ways of skinning this cat. The scary part with doing this as a quadcopter is you've got quadcopter blades, uh, which even on a five pound drone is enough to really slice up a person. You know, one of my friends has these serrated cuts going down his arm like every half inch <laughs> the length of his arm. <laughs> And was describing how there was like blood dripping from the ceilings in the lab at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a full size one like this around humans is a daunting prospect if things go wrong. Well, what, what actually got me um, thinking about something to solve that problem was um, parachutes. In that right now, I believe if you just let the parachute naturally deploy, it takes something like 600 feet 200 meters for the parachute to fully deploy and actually arrest the motion of something. Whereas if you could use some kind of explosive trigger to deploy the parachute very rapidly, I wonder if, again, using the concept of computer control, if the computer could detect that the drone is, you know, the mechanical components of the drone have lost control. Because it, I agree with you that for any of this to take place close to humans and not just be kind of a playtime technology for people in outdoor parks, we have have to think very, very carefully about safety. And I wonder if that's one way to deal with it or if there are other ideas to sort of handle the issue of safety. Yeah, please go ahead. So with safety, again, you know, in the case of parachutes, you're talking about the loss of the power system itself while you're at altitude. And so that immediately implies you're flying substantially, you know, fairly high. But it's more of the propeller even at ground level, you know. So an aircraft with a spinning propeller, if you think about it, it is like a food grinder. Suddenly it's like here's the cutting edge of a lawnmower or a blender with around at high speed and if somebody goes near those blades at ground level you're in serious trouble in terms of being able to injure somebody and there's really no other good way of moving air you know other than rockets or something which have other issues heat and flame and whatnot and propellers have a lot of sound issues as well so suddenly you've got something that's extremely loud and imagine you want to come home at two in the morning you're going to wake up your entire neighborhood the other issue is while you're in flight suddenly you've got some sort of engine failure now in the case of internal combustion, this is significant. My feeling is with triple redundancy, so let's say minimum nine propellers or nine thrust units of whatever they are, we can have three entirely separate flight control systems running in parallel with triple redundancy the whole way down. And even on the power system, we can have lithium ion and super caps and a few other, maybe a, I was thinking a small hobby level gas turbine engine driving a generator. So we could have this thing where it's power from, let's say, biodiesel or some sort of hydrocarbon fuel driving a gas turbine for our main power source, and then the lithium ion and capacitors would be for some sort of power failure backup system. And the intent there would be to be able to just glide or bring you down the aircraft safely, as opposed to trying to do something with parachutes, because I think helicopter blades and quadcopter blades and parachutes really are not going to agree with each other. You just can't put a parachute on a helicopter, or even parachuting out of a helicopter is a frightening concept because you would just get sucked straight into the blades of the aircraft unless you were substantially, you know, considerably below the aircraft. So there's safety issues like this. Again, I think that with electronic control systems, these can actually be addressed fairly well. If you look at some of the older aircrafts like autogyros and ultralights and fixed wing, they have mechanical inherent built-in safety systems where they are capable of gliding or autogyroing where the downward force would actually continue you spinning the helicopter blade, even if the engine cancels. So when a helicopter loses engine power, it doesn't just drop out of the sky like a brick. They can actually glide to a stop. Certainly any kind of winged aircraft would be capable of that as well. Great. Okay. And then the topic also of a lot of people, when they think flying cars, they actually want to be able to operate the controls. And I'm thinking, well, you know, we've got drunk drivers ending up stuck on rooftops and telephone poles. I just posted a picture on Facebook of someone that ended up in the lobby of a red lobster with a vehicle. And the last thing we want is suddenly drunk drivers falling out of the sky onto our rooftops. No kidding. So I think that we're going to have to go autonomous and electric power to make this worthwhile. So there's several groups actually that are more professional, like uh, there's a group called Sustainable Aviation and uh, another group called Cafe Foundation that are both advocating for electric vehicles. And let me pull up the guy's name from the Sustainable Aviation Foundation. Sure, yeah. The 
Michael came down, gave a talk. Brian Seeley of Sustainable Aviation gave a talk at the Hacker Dojo, and his group actually went through the mathematics and numbers. It was an incredible talk because it really kind of filled in a lot of the stuff that I didn't even consider or hadn't gotten that far on, which is most commute is typically under 30 miles, and that doing this with aviation, like flying, would actually be more fuel efficient than driving. Even with a carbon, even with an internal combustion engine on the helicopter? Well, helicopters aren't particularly efficient, but with like a fixed wing aircraft, if you can get around the whole taxiing and traffic control issues of airports, which certainly autonomous vehicles would do, computerized traffic management systems and whatnot, it would actually be far more efficient to fly, you know, those 30 miles. And certainly by the time you go well beyond 30 miles to 100 or more, flying is just vastly more efficient. I mean, getting on a commercial aircraft to go to Denver cost me $250 round trip last night on Southwest. And, you know, that would cost me far more in gasoline than if I had to try and drive. So the fuel efficiency of an aircraft full of people is much better than a vehicle on the road. So he actually made some really good arguments showing the economics of this. And having been an inventor for the past 30 years, economics drives everything. So as soon as all of the key pieces that are missing come together, which are really the the autonomous control system software, which is there. I mean, we've got this on small drones right now where we could do mission path planning and GPS and everything completely autonomous. Doing this with a full-size aircraft with a person on board wouldn't be very difficult. Okay, that's great. Michael, I think you have a question. Uh, Go ahead. That's a very, very interesting comment that you provided there in autonomous and being electric. I was just wondering, in terms of like looking at paths to wider adoption, especially for human carrying autonomous UAVs, what would you be? I think maybe we might need to design some intermediate use cases for autonomous drones. And before we can get to a point where we have wider adoption of it for human transportation, what do you think would be that part to wider adoption? That what is what is checklist that you know the industry needs to check the point we need to check to get to that point? Well, I think that autonomous vehicles on the road are probably the first step. So high end lidars like the stuff that the Luminar is putting together, I think, is going to be critical. I mean. The lighter we have isn't exactly right for flying vehicles, but it's close. And it's a small step to go from what we're doing now with cars to flying vehicles. One of the bigger concerns is just impacting flying birds and running into wires and things like this. You know, I had a friend die at the San Carlos airport trying to land and hit one of the power lines there. So running into things like wires in the air power lines has always been a concern when you're flying low to the ground. So sensors, radio position systems like GPS, but let's say ground-based, and there's a number of protocols coming together, European standards mostly like V to X and V to V, that will allow cars to communicate with each other and report each other's locations, kind of like transponders, so that other airborne vehicles will be aware of each other's locations, as well as being able to do like range finding between them using radio systems. So I think it's going to be a combination of sensors, which are coming together for self-driving vehicles and the radio technology and then the overall control system and management of this. And again, there's a lot of debates on, you know, is this some sort of central civic authority that kind of like a citywide air traffic control that dictates where the vehicles go or the vehicle's going to be mostly independent, making their own decisions and courses without a central authority, but still have some way of communicating and negotiating safely. So at some point, there might be things like traffic lanes, which full-size aircraft have now. So it's like odd altitudes of like 31 thousand feet the planes are traveling east and 32,000 feet they're traveling west or have something to that effect. I don't know the exact details, but they have some way of negotiating certain altitudes, traffic going in certain directions. So when we're talking about operating things low to the ground, I suspect, again, a lot of freight, cargo, food delivery are probably going to be first. And then once you've got cargo the size of human traffic, it's a small step to eventually have people on them as well. So there's a whole bunch of kind of whole ecosystem that's slowly going to have to just piece itself together. John, I'd be interested to follow up with you on your talking about communication protocols. You mentioned V to X and V to V. I guess V to V stands for vehicle to vehicle, so a more decentralized protocol that you mentioned the Europeans are working on or that's being worked on in Europe. It seems to me like this is precisely the kind of mission critical application for a decentralized protocol, given that the drones 
close to one another need to communicate to let each other know. Let's say there's a bird in the way, they can one drone can tell the other drones about that bird, power lines, etc. So it does seem like it's the absolutely perfect application for communication that's decentralized in that way. And it seems like there's also a potential there to avoid what could turn into an extremely centralized approach where let's say the government is tracking the position of every single drone. And that starts to make it difficult for someone to conceal their movement from the government, you know, just in a reasonable privacy uh, sense, if every single drone is being tracked by a central authority. So it might be nice at this juncture for someone to develop some kind of open source or standards-based protocol so drones can communicate with one another and give their sensor data to one another in an open protocol that is fully decentralized. I wonder what you think about that. Well, I think having a central authority would slow things down immensely. I mean, just even the air traffic control towers right now haven't managed to get to this point with regular aircraft and trying to be able to do this on a massive scale with every single vehicle that we have on the ground driving right now suddenly would have to be doing an airborne version of this. I think it's just, you know, waiting for that to occur would really set things back. But yeah, so the protocol I was thinking of was Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, ADAS, which does V to I and V to X which is vehicle to everything. Although there's a group giving a talk in Fremont later this week on that subject. They're talking about having your cell phone keep track of pedestrians for the vehicles. And I'm like thinking, okay, we're going to have to tag every pedestrian. So what if some little kid runs out in the street and they don't have a phone on them? They're just going to run them over? (laughs) (laughs) You know, so... I think that having really advanced radar and LIDAR and vision systems, I think is going to be absolutely critical for the success of some of these systems. So obviously, beyond just communication, right, you're going to start talking about safety in terms of cyber attacks can a drone be hacked into. And then, you know, what happens when an autonomous drone is being attacked on the outside? You know, let's say somebody is firing a bullet or from another, you know, vehicle to the drone. You know, how can the drone protect itself? Information attack, both physical and software based, in terms of uh, cyber attack. What are your views on those? It's, it's a little hard for me to make out what you're saying. Yeah. So you're saying what if somebody tries to hack the system? Yes. So if somebody tries to like hack the system, so that somebody on the outside is trying to gain control of the drone. So those are the issues, you know, for example, they would need to deal with. And then, for example, if the drone is being attacked on the outside, say, for example, somebody might be, you know, firing a gun to the drone, for example, on the outside, can an autonomous drone put itself, you know, for a man, vehicle, you have a pilot who could adjust to the situation, for example. So I don't know what you have to say in those circumstances. So I'm actually leading a group at the Hacker Dojo. We call it Fly by SDR Group. And it's in preparation for something called the DARPA Hack Fest, which is taking place in November. And it is about using software to find radio to basically operate drones and prevent them from being hackable, as well as possibly to hack drones as well. So using a software to find radio, being able to step into somebody's current Wi-Fi session and hijack a drone has been demonstrated. It's actually been done in military situations. I think it was Iran that captured one of our drones a few years back. But these are assuming ground-based stations that intercepted the control signals of a drone, where I think at this point, like the autonomous vehicle system, we're going to be looking at putting a small supercomputer on board a vehicle like this, and it's going to be flying mostly autonomous. So having drones that would operate entirely based on GPS and ground-based sensors. There's already people doing this out there quite successfully, with small-scale drones and military drones, and the Tomahawk cruise missiles were famous for being able to do this kind of thing, where once they launched it, it was doing all the navigation and terrain mapping and everything entirely disconnected and radio silent. So hacking only really occurs when we're relying on radio-based systems, and there's open-source software on GitHub that will allow you to generate your own GPS signals, which would be able to basically allow you to hijack a drone and steer it wherever you want because you can just lie about your GPS data. And if it's relying entirely on GPS, then you can totally trick it to thinking that it's going someplace completely different than it thinks it's going. So I wonder if... Uh, so I think there's a number of things that has to occur in that space. Yeah. I w- What's your question? Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add to your point there. You're talking about hacking the GPS 
GPS signal. And it makes me wonder if, you know, for example, we can detect the position of the moon through, you know, launching a laser beam at the moon and having it bounce back and position the moon at a millimeter resolution or probably greater than that even just by timing the signal time difference. And of course, using radar, we can do similar things that doesn't require a line of sight. I mean, I'm not the expert on this, but I'm pretty sure that that's all correct. So it does seem like, for example, if we had drones flying in dense cities with lots of buildings around, just like we have cell phone towers right now, I wonder if those towers could be emitting a signal, but I wonder if that signal could be, or that transponder for a given tower could be registered on some blockchain that's validated And so it's impossible to spoof a given transponder signal because it's registered in a public ledger. And once again, we still retain the decentralized nature of the navigation system that I think we're all agreeing would be favorable over a centralized system. Just a thought. Well, the blockchain is probably not going to be very useful in this kind of situation. Uh, You know, it's fairly slow. It actually is a decentralized database. But as far as helping you authenticate the validity of that tower, it's probably not going to be very, very much use. And again, all I'd have to do is, let's say, put a radio link or some sort of thing where I can tunnel that tower's communication, let's say, a half a mile over, and suddenly you can do all your communication thinking that and talk to the real tower, except that I've just relocated it, you know, a mile over. <laughs> And you'd have no idea that you're talking to a repeated version of the tower, not the actual tower. (laughs) Um, Fair enough. Yeah. So there's a lot of trickery that can go on. So again, things like video cameras and LIDAR that get ground truth that's actually looking at the real world, I think, is going to be critical. Great point. I'd like to step back for a second. We've talked about some of the items on Michael's desired checklist for what it would take to get this technology off the ground, so to speak. Uh, Forgive the pun. But... One thing that you uh, hinted at, John, near the beginning of our talk was noise levels. And it seems like that might be a pretty fundamental issue with operating drones in a dense public space, just like the sonic boom sort of condemned the Concorde into a very narrow role that ultimately became uneconomical, the route from London to New York that didn't cover any population areas. I wonder if if we end up having to limit drone operation to areas that are not populated, that will severely limit the kind of wonderful applications that we're no doubt thinking about right now. Well, I think this is where this intermodal container concept kind of comes in. So if you look at the history of shipping, the Greeks had these clay pots that were just enough for one person to carry and move and they stacked nice and all of the goods and merchandise had to fit in these clay jars. And, you know, these were fairly large clay jars, but they can put wine, they can put olives or oil or, you know, whatever goods they wanted all had to fit in these things and they were all uniform and stackable. And then later we had things like the barrel, the wooden barrels, which again, they put all their materials into those barrels. And now today we've got the intermodal container system, which is a fantastic fantastic history of these things. And their standard hull spacings and all these ships going back and forth between the U.S. and China and all this international trade has really been facilitated by these land, sea, air containers. So that these giant 40-foot and 24-foot containers can go on the back of trucks, they can go on trains, they can go on the ships, they can go in airplanes. And the contents of these containers, the shipper really just doesn't care about. You know, the customs people do, but everything has to fit within a container. And so I'm looking at now we want to implement, you know, autonomous transportation systems. And I'm looking at what I call, and I gave a talk about this like three years ago at the Robotics as a Business Conference with what I call the real IoT or the Internet of Transportation. And so once we standardize the container for moving cargo and passengers, suddenly imagine taking the drivetrain from a Tesla car and being able to drop onto that a container that's your basically your car body. So you've got your chair, your briefcases, and other stuff that you carry around between home and work every day in your vehicle, you know, all the stuff in your trunk could be picked up by a set of wheels and transported. And then if you wanted to travel farther, that can then be lifted up onto a drone. And so maybe reserving a certain region of the city that's far enough away from housing where you can have the wheels take you to that region and then lift you up and transport you between cities. Let's say I want to go between San Francisco and San Jose. You'd start your journey from your house on a pair of electric wheels that would drive you two, three miles to 
an area where then you could take off and build the bulk of your travel or put you onto a hyperloop or whatever sort of ground transportation system makes most sense. And if it's all autonomous, as a passenger, you just push a button and you go from point A to point B and how you achieve it doesn't matter. I mean, Uber's still thinking along the lines of autonomous cars and the cars will go and charge themselves. Something like a robot's going to have to come in and clean them out when they get dirty. And then the vehicle's going to find you, pick you up and deliver you the entire trip. And taking that to, okay, we're going to have air vehicles doing this is a small step. But I think at the end of the day, you know, you've got your smell, your stuff that you like to carry around with you, your sound system, and having your own private space that is independent of the wheels or the flight control system so that you don't have to worry about maintaining and buying new tires and checking the batteries. And I think that's ultimately probably where it's going to go. It does seem like we're kind of going in that direction with the Tesla being a drive-by-wire vehicle and separating the entire drivetrain and the mechanical, the movement part of the vehicle from the rest of it. It seems like that's the way they're being manufactured and that seems to make sense and fits with your idea of an intermodal uh, container concept there. It seems to me like it'll be critical to decide on what makes the most economic sense at each step of the transportation journey. So Hyperloop might make the most sense for intercity travel, but then within the city, there might be a different form of transportation. One thing that I reflect on living in dense city in Southeast Asia here, Bangkok, where the amount of land devoted to roads is about 7% of the city's footprint compared with a city like Houston, which would be more like 30 to 40 percent, you get into these amazing epic uh, traffic jams at almost all times of the day. And what I reflect on is how even the guy with the Maserati or the Lamborghini is sitting in the very same traffic as the guy with the donkey pulling the cart, right? There's no difference there. But if you could take your intermodal container and then just have that be lifted up by some grappling hook and out of the traffic, well, there you go. Now you're out of the traffic. That's what I thought of. Start your journey without ending up in the traffic in the first place. <laughs> Otherwise, you're leaving the husk of your car sitting in traffic. Yes, that's a fair point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In terms of regulation, right, we need to also look at that. In terms of regulation, what are the things that the industry and maybe research can also do to help government? Because government is currently like at a fix, right? They're not experts in, you know, autonomous vehicles or autonomous drones. And also, it's really difficult to regulate, to really come up with a regulation that can take care of all the stakeholders, you know, who are going to be affected by this innovation. You have the private, you know, residential, you know, dwellers, you have the owners of the vehicles, you have the general public, you have the industry. What are the things that we should be looking at as these innovations evolve to ensure that the similar adoption can be encouraged through better regulation? That's a great question, Michael. Yeah. I wonder about that too, because it does seem like regulations, of course, like anything else, they're sort of a step behind where it needs to be. And it does seem like the first places that it would be logical for city-operated people carrying drones to operate would be in the dense cities of Southeast Asia. And I wonder if they'll end up relaxing the regulations first in an attempt to leapfrog some of the places that you might think would be the first adopters of technology like in the U.S. or Europe. Well, it's interesting because, you know, California has just issued its 37th self-driving car license for experimental self-driving vehicles. And at the same time, India just passed a law outlawing self-driving vehicles that they don't want to put people out of work. You know, they have very different philosophy. So, you know, I see this as kind of an arms race, though, where if we don't open up regulation to allow this to happen and China does, say, for example, or other countries, suddenly they're going to get more efficient. The traffic's going to thin up and their economies are going to start booming as suddenly they're spending less money on fuel and people we're getting around easier, the friction, if you will, gets reduced. Any country that insists on not going that route is going to get left behind. And, you know, so I definitely see America, hopefully, as being one of the more progressive ones. Uh, I was shocked to see that the city of San Francisco, within hours of Uber publicly sharing or the word getting out that Uber had a self-driving car on the streets in San Francisco, they actually passed a law banning 
getting it within hours. I mean, so you sit there and you look at the legal system, you go, well, geez, these guys move slow as molasses. And yet they were able to get up and act a ban within the course of half a day. At the same time, you know, Elon Musk has made incredible strides getting the federal government to change regulation to allow his vehicle through. And so I think that when big industrialists and large corporations like Google or somebody start advocating, I think that laws can change very quickly. I think for small entrepreneurs, though, we're pretty much stuck living within the existing law set that's out there until a big company decides to step up and apply pressure. Well, Uber wasn't big when it first started flouting the laws around taxi licensing, and I'd argue that that's what made it big. It's interesting to see how companies like Uber or Sci-Hub, which is basically upending the scientific publication industry right now by releasing almost every scientific article for free on this website that's hosted somewhere in the former Soviet bloc, where it's out of the reach of Elsevier and, and the other major scientific publications. So it seems to me like the lesson of Uber and the lesson of Sci-Hub is to do as Grace Hopper exhorted us to do do, which is to ask for forgiveness and not for permission. Now, I'm not going to go on record here and say everyone should just be flying their drones wherever they want. And clearly, there is a need for a regulatory framework. But I think there's also, we should also recognize that sometimes the future seems to favor the bold approach in some of these technologies that are held down by really old fashioned regulations. Well, you know, a friend of mine pointed out that you know, every line in the fire code was paid for by somebody's life. And and as sort of somebody who's been a legendary hacker, you know, I actually was very involved in the release of the Berkeley Unix to the Internet back in 92 and a number of other things. You know, there's a time to sort of flout the authorities and the law like Uber did. And there's a time to not do that. And knowing which is which and what you can get away with, I think, is really the secret to being successful. There's gray line. So Uber kind of was able to ride on that gray line where they were kind of getting around some of the taxi laws, but at the same time, the taxi laws were only put in because the taxis, which companies advocated for these laws, as opposed to things like the traffic safety issues where, you know, they caught the Uber run a, a red light and the city's like, you know, somebody's going to die if we don't shut this down now. So I think as soon as you start trying to build a real company and you've got investor money on the line, you really can't start flouting the law like this or you're going to be in trouble very quickly. That's a great point. And I, wonder, your investors. and I wonder if the individuals operating in this industry have a responsibility to their peers to not wreck it for everybody else. If, you know, the first people carrying drone startup that crashes with a bunch of passengers is going to set back the whole industry quite a distance because it's going to scare places and jurisdictions into banning the whole technology. So I agree that a cautionary approach, maybe the better analogy is with people carrying uh, private space technology, where, again, they're trying to be very careful, and each accident is very critical uh, to the industry or is an exercise in soul searching every time it happens. So here at Let's Make the Future, we talk about future technologies, but we also talk about their implications for society and for the future. So I'd like to spend the next approximately 10 minutes before we're done to kind of get audacious here and to think about the implications of, I think it'd be interesting for us to examine the kind of society that would be if we had these kinds of technologies fully adopted or widely adopted. So it seems to me like human carrying drones could transport people and goods both within and between especially dense cities, they could even do it balcony to balcony, which would be superior to point to point. You could leave from your balcony, get onto a drone and fly to the next balcony. I wonder if this would create a kind of a different society in some cities where some people might never go down to the ground floor of their city because they can just stay at the higher levels. And I wonder if this will help to exacerbate inequality in societies if people never interact with those that perhaps can't afford to live at the higher levels of some of these cities. I see that kind of social strata already in Bangkok, but at least there's um, some forced interaction that has to take place when people who live in these ultra luxury condominiums have to at least go down to the ground floor and walk past the poorer people in the society. I also think about the implications to cities with the existing infrastructure, 
Because the great thing about drones is they don't require linkage infrastructure between transportation nodes. I guess any flying technology has this property. So unlike cars or unlike Hyperloop, you don't need to build billions of dollars of infrastructure in the form of roads and tunnels to connect people from one place to another. Instead, the only infrastructure you need are the drones and potentially charging stations for those drones. So billions of dollars in infrastructure might become unnecessary. And it also might free up large amounts of space in cities if it's widely adopted enough for parks or meeting places for people. When I think of a beautiful, idyllic living space, I think of maybe Venice, in Italy or Santorini or a national park. But imagine if our transportation needs were met by drones and then roads didn't really even need to be built very much in cities. We could be living in a paradise on the ground there in cities without the cars constantly interrupting our lives. So I wonder if this technology might end up being as important for the 21st century as cars were for the 20th. Yeah, well, you know, sci-fi has actually done a really good job of exploring this. I actually worked on a book which never really made it out there uh, with a fellow named Alex Lightman, who's also a futurist, called The Future Engine on how science fiction really kind of shows a lot and allows us to like try on new clothes. You know, we can try on different ideas and present them to the public in science fiction before actually trying to implement technology out in the real world. And so I could go through a long list of sci-fi movies that had autonomous vehicles in place and flying cars and, and various conceptual ideas, everything from Fifth Element, which everyone loved, Blade Runner and other stories tried to depict worlds like this. And they're probably not too far from the mark, ultimately, when these things get implemented. So I even wrote a short story on how a city would look like with a combination of sort of augmented reality and self-driving cars, where suddenly the need for street signs and all the signage at street level goes away, because augmented reality would present signs and digital information to pedestrians and people in the vehicles. And yet at the same time, the vehicles aren't going to need street signs and street lights as well. And then you end up with the problem of, again, you know, the guy with the donkey cart wants to get on the road could present quite the challenge to autonomous vehicles that try and want to habitate with them. So I think there's going to be a lot of negotiation that occurs during the transition period. And ultimately, I think it's all going to be autonomous systems in the end, this internet of transportation, I'm calling it. And so the way I model this is this change in transportation systems is going to be like the change we saw with the internet with data. So one of the things that occurs when suddenly we can get this real-time information moving freely as opposed to having to stamp it onto a CD or print it onto a piece of paper or connect over a phone line and download it from some BBS or something at much slower rates or TV where it's just broadcast out the same copy to everybody, suddenly this concept of granularity occurs where I don't need to get the entire newspaper. I can just read the one article that's of interest to me. I don't have to cut it out with a piece of paper and physically hand it to a friend when there's something interesting, he could just forward it to me via email. And so suddenly I'm able to get just the news that's of interest to me and not have to get all kinds of other stuff that comes along with it. And so you think about what's in your refrigerator right now. And, you know, you've got to buy a big box of frozen whatever or a whole gallon of milk and, you know, the entire box of cereal or a bag of carrots where there's going to be autonomous food preparation, autonomous farming. I've actually been, on, we never got funded, but several different efforts to try and build robotic farming systems, for example. The farms are going to be autonomous. The factories and warehouses are autonomous. The transportation linkages are autonomous. And suddenly I could go, oh, I'd like a fruit salad. And it will be able to pick the fruit, prepare the fruit, and deliver the fruit to my house in one pass, all in the course of 10, 15 minutes, fresh off the vine or off of the plant. So this ability to decentralize and granularize means that I don't have to buy in bulk what I need. I can get just what I need in real time and live a much lighter life, if you will. I don't have to have a house full of all kinds of stuff because it can be brought to me as needed. Does that kind of make sense? I suppose that's what's happening with Amazon and the vision there to bring down the transportation time to get things so you don't think about it when you want to order something on Amazon Echo. No matter how small the item is, Amazon wants to basically be a loss leader in those items to get people 
essentially addicted to ordering things in that granular fashion. But that farm to table idea is mind blowing. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot of that happening with not just food, but everything. The reduction of the transportation costs means that I don't have to have a washer and dryer. It could go to a central place where it's done automatically. So I think at the end, you know, we're going to be like living as if everyone's living in a five-star hotel or something where everything's done for us, you know? That's fantastic. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, go ahead. I'll I'll shut up. (laughs) So, I mean, I think it's been like an amazing time thinking about talking about drones and what implications they have for our future. And I think um, overall, the boiling of future is would be to appropriately and accurately co- communicate what are the cost benefits of these new innovations for society. And then we need to also communicate the, all this, these cost benefits or the actual, like for example, Michael, you mentioned the fact that reduction in infrastructure costs, the fact that having a drone uh, vehicle or uh, uh, Means that we would not have to build linkages between two locations. You know, we could just have ports where they land, and that's it. And that could be saved billions of dollars in infrastructure. And then John mentioned the fact that we don't have to make our lives complicated. We just have to do all the things, you know, where we need them. We just have to be, our lives becomes more simple, less complex. And more fun. So those are like big improvements to the way we live our lives right now that, you know, people don't actually talk about when we talk about drones. We are more akin to talk about the risk element or what if there's a cyber attack or what if there's a crash. But there's some actual also big time a real benefit that society needs to be aware of and think about. And I think those would be the burden of future as like us to communicate to society. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself, Michael. And I'd like to thank you, John, for participating on short notice, might I add, and sharing with us your obviously very deep knowledge on this subject. So thank you so much for taking some time on your Sunday morning here to talk to us. So I just want to give you a chance. If there's anything else you'd like to say, please go ahead. Yeah, well, I've got a whole long list of protocols and information. I have several blogs I write on a number of topics, so they can connect through uh, John, dot com to find out more about that. And thank you very much, Michael, for the opportunity. Thank you again, John. I just want to just thank John for making the, uh, the session this morning very early in the day on a Sunday. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Let's make the future. Music and editing. Christian Peltonen.